hier sind wir bei Gürtelnei The Mammoth Universe. Ich bin gespannt. So, hier kommen die Inhalte für die nächsten zwei Jahre. Okay, uh, so hi, I'm Tony Zerbeck and I'm the director of Persistent Universe for Star Citizen. Ja, jetzt kommt, kommt das richtig geile Zeug. I'll be doing the lead vocals tonight and over here on my right on the keyboard is Jake Mealy, our economy designer from Austin. Hi. And we're going to be showing you something pretty interesting tonight, uh, and I want to make sure to call out uh, our guitar and bass players back in Montreal, Martin and uh, Robert Lysi. Yeah, that's right. They spent a lot of time working with us over the last, you know, four, five, six months, um, you know, very, very intensely on what we're going to be revealing tonight. It's been a bit of a stealth project recently. Uh, we've actually shown it to very few people within Cloud Imperium because we wanted to get it to a level of maturity to where it was very easy for people to understand what the benefits of this new technology were going to be. And I'm going to give you a glimpse of it tonight, uh, but you're going to need some background information to truly appreciate it. So bear with me for a bit and you'll see why we consider it quantum leap. So, As everybody here obviously knows, uh, Star Citizen is a very ambitious project. Our goal is to deliver a variety of incredibly detailed solar systems that behave in logical fashion and then give you ample freedom to follow your interests, whatever they may be. Thus Ooh. far, we've been focused entirely on a single system, Stanton, which includes four planets, 12 moons, 225 economic nodes, 44 trading outposts, 13 rest stops, and 50 asteroid fields. So yeah, it's really big. The point of this presentation then is to give you a better understanding of how, when the first one's taken so long, we're aiming to kick things into overdrive so that we can deliver new systems much more quickly. Mm -hmm. This involves, obviously, a lot of different areas. Procedural generation of terrain, modular art sets, algorithmic detailing of buildings and interiors, and a lot of other stuff. For the purposes of this talk, though, I'm going to focus on what I call the dynamic content. So, what is dynamic content? Dynamic content responds to player and NPC actions in logical fashion. It's systemic. This means that the universe is in constant motion, which makes it a far more interesting place to explore. Most missions should, of course, be dynamic in nature. They should only be offered when there's an actual need for something. This might take the form of a factory that needs some aluminum to create a retail product, a criminal that needs to be brought to justice, or someone that needs to lift from one location to another. At their core, missions are services provided by one party for the benefit of another, and they are therefore one of the fundamental ways by which imbalances in the economy can be addressed. Mm -hmm. Likewise, economic nodes, which include things like refineries, factories, and retail shops, need to be dynamic since they must continually take into account the various market forces and adjust accordingly. When demand for something outstrips supply, whether it's iron ore, bullets, or ship repairs, you expect prices to rise. And conversely, when there's an excess of something, you expect that prices will fall. There's more to it, of course. Concepts like marginal demand and price discovery requ require a fair bit of math. But in the end, it's all about the constant search for equilibrium as production and consumption levels vary. I'll get around to explaining probability volumes in more detail in a bit, but suffice to say for now that they dictate what you encounter as you travel through a given area. As so such, they should neues. probably be dynamic. Nur so, schöner formuliert, was sie in den letzten Jahren gesagt haben oder was er gesagt hat. In valuable commodities is discovered, you'd expect to find a lot of NPC miners in the area, but as the resources are gradually depleted, their numbers should start to fall off. Pirates should gravitate toward areas with a lot of value to plunder and recoil as the amount of security ticks up. So let's look into each of these areas in a bit more detail and see why we've struggled to set up a single solar system and at the same time get a precise understanding of what needs to happen so that we can start moving a lot faster. We'll start with the missions. A Star Citizen mission is fundamentally just a container for code and data, similar in concept to a class in any of a multitude of modern-day programming languages. 
inputs can be passed into a mission from either the runtime environment or services to allow for customization. This allows designers to do things like, say, inject the type and quantity of cargo, whether the ship should be damaged or not, and where the ship should be heading into a generic transport scenario so that we can reuse the same framework for a lot of different situations. Missions can have content tags embedded within themselves to denote their composition, whether they contain security, pirates, freighters, miners, asteroids, or some kind of a combination. Missions can also have thematic tags applied. These don't specify physical content, but rather detail the headline story behind the scenario that a designer created. So designers uh, can differentiate between an NPC mission giver, for Idee. example, or a probability volume covering the area around the world. 500 Euro mehr kosten. This is time Wer consuming weiß, and greatly nicht. complicates maintenance. Mal sehen, ob wir da später noch mehr Informationen like zu kriegen. ...is split into sub-tags like Pirate Light and Pirate Heavy, so that we can have more control over what we're aiming to instantiate, you have to go to every place you would assign the original mission category and individually determine which of the new ones should be enabled. Worse, this isn't dynamic at all. Mission content is fixed to specific NPCs and locations, so there's no evolution. The universe is Gibt auch ein paar static. andere Sachen, aber die sind zu spektakulativ, die sage ich noch gar nicht. Also da ist noch nicht genug drüber bekannt jetzt. Zumindest mir nicht. Deswegen teile ich es jetzt nicht mit euch, nicht, dass ihr euch irgendwie Hoffnung macht oder so. Ich habe Hoffnung. This lack of context means that we can't exploit a mission's ability to have information injected into it for customization, and that means that you see a lot less diversity, despite requiring just as much work. The last problem, and it's a big one, is that there's no NPC regulation of the mission content. Missions are the basic units of work for the economy, and if someone doesn't do what needs to be done, then everything grinds to a halt. In a properly functioning system, NPCs need the ability to step up if players aren't going to, and the risk reward justifies the effort, and do the work themselves. If a commodity can be purchased at one location and sold at another for a dramatic markup, and there isn't enough cost or risk involved in the transport to warrant the, differ the differential, NPCs should seize the opportunity and move the material themselves until the price starts to make sense. So, let's talk yeah, about economic nodes now. Funktioniert das irgendwie schon in einer Weise? Oder ist das nur die Idee jetzt dahinter? Via an ich glaube, es ist nur die Idee dahinter. Kiosk, a UI interface or an NPC that possesses an item manifest detailing the items it wants to buy or sell, storage capacity and a fair bit of data related to determining prices. This includes refineries that process ore, factories that produce goods and retail stores where you buy finished products. Factory inputs aren't explicitly denoted, but are instead derived from the production formulae of whatever they manufacture. Prices, what economic nodes are willing to pay for their inputs, and what they want in order to sell, are determined algorithmically based upon the rate of change of their, of their inventory versus the tangent of a pricing curve. This means that they're smart enough to, say, raise the price of what they're selling, even when their inventory is low, if they detect that they're being resupplied at a sufficient rate to get where they want to be in a reasonable amount of time. So clearly, there's some dynamism happening here, which is fantastic. Unfortunately, that's where the good news ends. Ich denke, dass der Mission Builder bereits eingesetzt wird. Ja, äh, die Grundzüge davon schon, aber ich glaube nicht, dass äh, diese Economy dahinter schon As existiert missions, tatsächlich. Economic nodes don't have any real context in terms of supply and demand, and there's no systemic flow of goods throughout the economy. Why does a refinery want ore? Why is an NPC willing to buy some drugs for you, from you? Where does the shop get the goods that it's selling? Right now, the answer to all these questions is the same. We fake it. Economic nodes conjure up their own supply and demand out of thin air. If a node is designated as wanting to purchase a particular item, for example, designers dictate a formula that describes how that inventory will be gradually burned off so that they want more. These products you deliver to a node then, they don't actually go anywhere. There's no real demand. This is impossible to balance because while production and consumption are fixed, the player count isn't. Sometimes 100 players are interacting with an economic node, and sometimes none. And I mention this because behind the scenes, 
at the economic level, all of the players, despite being on different servers, really are connected to one single system. A real economy is a tangled web of dependencies, and you can't expect logical results when its gears can completely seize up due to the action or inaction of players. What we really need, then, is MPC regulation of the system, for MPCs to purchase items when they need them, thus keeping the demand side logical, while stepping in to help with the supply when players don't and the risk reward warrants. Das Argument verstehe ich nicht. This has ripple effects into other areas. Entweder if the man hat for missile spike eine Economie, die von den Playern beeinflusst wird, oder nicht. Und die ist normal, wenn sie von den Playern, wenn sie nur von den Spielern beeinflusst wird und nicht von den NPCs. Die balanciert sich automatisch so aus, wie sie sein soll. Oder wie sie realistisch wäre. Man kann nicht ein realistisches System mit NPCs faken, damit Spieler kein realistisches System erstellen. Also, wenn ihr versteht, was ich meine. These kinds of knock-on effects, in fact, should happen regardless of whether any player is in an area. And that's a separate problem I'll talk about more when we get to probability volumes. Und, und Missionen so look at what means haben jetzt auch nicht direkt wirklich was mit Economy zu tun oder sollten es nicht haben. Missionen sollten für Spieler sein, um stabile Einkommensquelle zu haben, wenn sie sie brauchen. Und Economy sollte etwas sein, das durch Handel entsteht und durch äh, das Heranschaffen und Verkaufen von Ressourcen. Oder? This information can be archetyped, but of course the world's a lot more interesting if every economic CG node is a bit sich, different. So uh, there's still a lot of balancing that that happen. Happen. Damit eben nicht dasselbe wie in Eve's uh, Burn, uh, Burn so now passiert. let's take a look at the economic nodes. Aber andere Spiele bekommen das auch hin. System. Und Eve ist ja auch so stark, weil es diese Player Economy hat. Die ist da vielleicht ein bisschen zu kompliziert oder so, aber And finally, let's take ich bin per se erstmal eigentlich auch für ein offenes System. System. Wenn sie es gut That's hinkommen, so dass es Spaß macht, okay, aber as we're routinely naja. adding new items and changing prices. And the worst part is that it's all extremely rigid. There's no way to have an economic node increase how much of something it produces or consumes, because those things are attached to formulae naja, that have no understanding of external events. So right now, aber die größten Allianzen haben ja auch nur Konkurrenz untereinander. Und zum Schluss ist es ja dann like auch wieder ausgeglichen. Even if it's not. If an area is configured to have a lot of pirates, they increase the price offsets and demand. Ich sag nicht, dass sie es wie Eve machen sollen. Das, das meine ich nicht. Ich verstehe nur das Argument nicht, ähm, dass man keine Kontrolle darüber will, keine direkte, nicht die Werte selbst beeinflussen möchte. Aber dann NPCs erstellen, die das trotzdem so machen, wie man das selbst haben möchte. Also sie erstellen ein System, das letztendlich das macht, was sie dann auch irgendwie indirekt selber machen wollen. Ich weiß nicht, ob ich das gerade gut formuliere. <laughs> so, what is a probability volume? A probability volume is an area of space that contains information detailing what you should see as you pass through the area. It's an optimization of sorts in that it allows us to achieve a desired effect. A certain number of pirates in an area. Aber er hat sich da garantiert mehr Gedanken drüber gemacht als ich jetzt also. Without having to burn a lot of computational horsepower simulating things when there are no players around to see it. This is accomplished via linking mission content tags to probability curves that span all or part of the expanse of the volume. So, for example, you can denote that security ships are commonplace near Port Olisar and gradually fall off over a couple hundred kilometers, whereas it's very rare to see pirates who would prefer to avoid security close to Port Olisar, but more likely to see them as you get farther away. There are quite a few different types of curves denoting, uh, there are quite a few different types of curves Because, un because until a player actually accepts one of these missions and heads to that uh, location, there are a variety of probabilities. I think some of our notes got skewed up here. Uh, anyway, so one, one of the more interesting types of curves is the spoofing curve, which allows missions to skirt the normal rules requiring that they can only be created in the proximity of a player. And this is done so that an NPC can request that you travel to them to provide something they desire, in which case, obviously, we can't limit them to only existing in your immediate, in yours or another player's immediate proximity. Mit den NPCs hat CLG indirekte Kontrolle über Bedarf und Nachfragen. In EVE Online gibt es keine Grenzen. Zum Beispiel für Preisabsprachen. Das schadet auf langer Sicht äh, dem normalen Spieler. The reason it's called spoofing uh, is ja, because we only keep a small stub active on the back end, which is way more efficient. 
Also die, die Spieler, die da nicht so tief reingehen, schadet das auf jeden Fall. Damit vertreiben sie allerdings mehr oder weniger dann den Economy-Spieler. Und wenn sie das sowieso tun, brauchen sie auch äh, ursprünglich ja das System nicht. Also das NPC-System, dann können sie es ja auch einfach direkt äh, die Preise und alles fest, fi fixiert festlegen, vielleicht mit leichten Schwankungen oder so. Aber wenn es sowieso letztendlich so möglichst alles in die Richtung geregelt wird, dass, wie CIG das möchte, brauchen sie ja dieses komplizierte System eigentlich nicht, oder? Das war nur das, was ich meinte. Obwohl ich per se die Idee gut finde. Ich bin ja auch kein Hardcore-Economy-Player. Ich bin ja auch Letztendlich eher casual. Ich stecke tief drin und so, aber ich bin eher ein casual Spieler dann tatsächlich. Zumindest momentan. Jetzt haben Here the player gets a hit from the asteroid probability. So the mission database is then queried to find missions with the associated content tag, dynamic parameters injected, and the mission is instantiated. And now a bit later, the, fre the player trips the freighter probability and then eventually runs into a pirate. The key point here is that much of the world exists as, as a superposition of probabilities until a player gets sufficiently close that the wave functions collapse, at which point we instantiate them and start simulating the full-blown entities. One of the quirks with probability volumes is that they usually represent a variety of low frequency events. Space is big after all, and even in a pretty heavily populated area, you shouldn't be running into other ships all that often. The problem is that the likelihood of multiple events happening simultaneously is a product of the probabilities, meaning that it's very unlikely you'd ever see two or more at the same time. So let's go ahead and see what this means in practice. Here's a player traversing a probability volume. He makes it through a good part of it before the freighter's probability curve determines that an encounter has occurred, at which point the probability volume queries the mission database with the freighter tag and instantiates a compatible mission. The player continues on, and shortly thereafter, the pirate's probability curve indicates a hit, which triggers another lookup into the mission database. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with this. In fact, it's a pretty accurate representation of what you realistically expect to see two rare events happening on their own schedule. The systemic behavior of the freighter and the pirate, even if spawned separately, would allow them to logically react to one another. So if they were spawned in close enough proximity, the pirate might even attack the freighter. The problem is that this approach lets the algorithms dictate too much of the experience, and if you're not careful, this can lead to the gameplay starting to feel very formulaic. What we really want is the ability for designers to craft more custom content and to then have a mechanism by which we can trigger it such that it all feels logical if a bit lucky in the timing. Mhm. Auch wenn die Economy nicht hundertprozentig von der Community kontrolliert wird, so simuliert CIG einen richtigen Markt. Das fühlt sich wahrscheinlich immersiver für große Allianzen an, aber die gibt die Kontrolle eben nicht vollkommen ab. Sowas gab es halt nur, äh, nur vorher noch nicht. Äh, noch nie. Ja. Das sehe ich auch, auch so, dass das im besten ja, Fall exakt so wird. Das ist für, dass die großen Allianzen trotzdem einen Profit machen können, wenn, wenn sie sich anstrengen yeah, oder gute, ähm, gute Economy-Player. Und dass die Kleinen einfach nichts davon mitkriegen. So. Ja. Ich denke mal, wenn sie da ein bisschen an den Zahlen rumschrauben, dass sie sagen, ja, okay, Citizen vielleicht Con, sind doch right? 80% äh, NPC gesteuert, yeah. doch besser als 90%. Right. Na, wir werden sehen. Ich bin gespannt, aber ich würde, würde halt gerne mal wirklich in-game was davon dann sehen von einer wirklichen dynamischen Wirtschaft. Okay, da kommt wohl noch was Großes. Ich bin, bin gespannt. I know it's a little bit odd to spend the first 20 minutes talking about all the problems with the game and how they've made creating one solar system so incredibly difficult but I do think it will help clarify the value of what we're going to be showing a little bit later okay, I think we're okay good. so we're back in live 
So what we do instead of basically allowing the algorithms to entirely control what you see after is we defer the activation for a short period of time and bend the probabilities of other things so that we're more likely to get a combination than would otherwise be the case. So they once again tra tr uh, the, the player once again triggers the freighter's probability, but rather than you already got it, yeah, yeah. So we're we're running a little bit ahead, but basically what you've seen here is the player hit the freighter's probability, held on to it. Um, we bent the probabilities to increase the likelihood of anything else being able to be attached. In this case, that, uh, that involved the freighter, that didn't involve the pirate, rather. So why does this matter? Think about a pirate and a freighter being created separately. It's gonna take a good while for the pirate to close the distance with the freighter, disable it, park next to it, and board it. This means that you'd never come upon a situation where the freighter's already been disabled and the pirates are rampaging through the ship, so you'd better hurry if you wanna save the crew. That's actually a really interesting scenario, though, one that'd be a lot of fun to experience. So while we're fine with the systemic functionality, driving things by default, we wanna be able to bend things towards more interesting situations without it ever feeling too random every once in a while. The problem with probability volumes, then, all comes down to their construction. Each one, and there are lots of them, contains a litany of curves and associated data and is set up by hand, which is time consuming and requires constant updating as other things change. One of the main reasons why they're so difficult to maintain is that many of the variables that a probability volume details should impact one another. More security in an area should of course impact the number of pirates, but because they're all handled independently, designers have to be very careful when modifying them. Mistakes are inevitably made, which results in a lot of sleuthing around to figure out what broke or is now poorly balanced and how to resolve it. The worst thing, though, is that they're static. If an area has a lot of pirates, it will always have a lot of pirates. There's nothing you or the NPC population can do to change that. Okay, the that's, that's won't interesting. vary based upon the level of threat in an area because the threat is always the same. Yeah. A new commodity discovery won't cause miners to move in uh, to exploit it and won't in turn attract pirates eager to prey on them. Demand for security patrols and escorts for that area won't increase in response to the pirates and the pirate threat won't recede as a result. What we really need then is a way to dynamically derive the probability curves based upon what's happening or rather should be also happening das 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 to resolve all these problems I've been pointing out across the solar system. So. I've called out a lot of very serious problems, things that require enormous amounts of bandwidth to set up and maintain and that still fail to deliver the experience we want. What we actually want is a dynamic, logical universe. We want mm -hmm. the demand for goods and services to be the result of a legitimate economic need, and we must have sufficient runtime context so that we can customize these modular mission templates. NPCs must be able to contribute in helping to turn the gears of the economy from buying and selling goods to creating and accepting missions. The system needs to automatically balance itself so that we can focus on the high-level rules instead of the details. All of this, too, has to be incredibly computationally efficient, which means we need a more focused simulation engine, one that's only concerned with what we need to achieve the desired effect. If we're ever going to reach a point where we can deliver new solar systems in a reasonable amount of time, then we're going to need to make a quantum leap. So, what's the solution? We can, uh, yeah, I'm supposed to flip. We'll flip over to the end. Uh, yep, let's go ahead and flip the screens. It's exciting, I really promise. <laughs> uh, there we go. Yeah, there it is. So this is quantum, and I know what you're thinking, and I've seen this before. If the visuals look you know, particularly familiar, it's because we started with the solar system map uh, that we released years ago. But this really is a totally different beast. The original star map referenced static data. There was nothing dynamic about it, but quantum is totally different. For starters, it has access to all of the backend services and can pull whatever data it needs from them. Everything you see on the screen then, that's real-time data pulled from the game. What? So let's go ahead and take a quick tour of the system. Uh, let's jump okay. on over to Hurston.
actually, I'm not getting the screen over here. I'm going to go ahead and jump over with you. I can't see anything. Just get on over. Okay, also kann man da die verschiedenen Sachen visuell noch mal sehen. There it is. First thing. Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and jump on over to everyone's favorite gas giant, Crusader. And in the background there, you can see Port Olisar. Let's go ahead and bring that up. Mm, okay. Now, let's, I mentioned that we're connected to all the real-time data. Uh, let's go ahead and see what the players are up to. Okay. Cool. Is this jetzt so, auf einem server or alle? Each alle. of those red dots is a real player, thousands of them across well over 100 servers. Uh, now, to okay. be honest, we recorded this earlier, mainly because we didn't know how many people would be playing the game while we were doing this show. Because y'all are and, here, right? And I figured it would be totally anticlimactic to say, here are all the players, and three dots showed up. <laughs> so let's go ahead and continue the tour of the solar system and jump on over to uh, Daymar. And you can see a number of people affixed to the planet. Some of those obviously are going to be at outposts. Some of them are inevitably mining. Um, over there on the right, you can see the, the current player list. Let's go ahead and see what a couple players are up to. Just go ahead and highlight them so we can see where they're at. And let's go ahead and jump to Circo Worm and see where he's at. It looks like he's in Lorville. Okay, this is interesting, but then... <laughs> what is when I don't want that someone sees me? And you can actually see some deaths down on the planet there. So obviously there's been some conflict there. And you actually see... Let's go ahead and back out a little bit and find there's a contract to the right. You have access to missions, so you can see that Clipsos Norwang is requesting personal transport to Norville, to Lorville, and he's uh, willing to pay $4,500. Good on you, buddy. Um, let's go ahead and jump on over to Ariel, and we can get a view of this. Das ist ein reines Dev Tool. Ach so, ups. Weil es so hübsch aussah, dachte ich, das ist uh, für uns tatsächlich. And so what Tut you're seeing leid. here, there are, like yeah, I mentioned, okay. there are a variety of different types um, and lots of different content and thematic tags for all these things. So you can see everything it's from the default tags, tool. you can see <laughs> the security reinforcement tags, the bounty hunter tags, the spoofing tags. Yeah, good, uh, dich there are a number of these. We'll be adding more. In general, what it's doing is, as I mentioned, uh, it's basically representing things in probabilistic state because it's too expensive for us to fully simulate them. Um, now let's go ahead and jump over to a shop. Let's check out the Hicks Research Station that's on Selen. Verändert er gerade das Live-Spiel? And let's go ahead and open up that shop. Oh look, here's... Yep, there's Outpost Korea, and you can see that there's a lot of, a lot of death around there. And over on the right at the Hicks Research Station, you can see all the things that it buys and sells and what those prices have been doing over time. Now, I suspect I know what you're thinking at this point. This is all very cool, but it doesn't really solve any of the fundamental problems that I mentioned earlier, and that's totally true. So let's clear the board and get to that. Die Reiserouten sind auch geil. Das finde ich eigentlich am geilsten, dass man sieht, die, wie die Leute hin und her flitzen. So, the primary reason for Quantum's existence is to enable us to have one unified world where we can, you know, simulate millions of NPCs and feed back into that all of the player actions into one unified whole. So there's really no difference. There are some optimized areas, the probability volumes that exist in between these two, you know, these two realities, but really this, you know, th this is this is the full-blown simulation. It takes into account all the player actions. Got it. So, let's go ahead and start by bringing a thousand quanta to life. You on the wrong one? Yeah. So, 
Jake here is cranking the number of quanta up to a thousand, and they're basically going to come streaming in from another system. Well, and into the universe there. These are simulated entities. <laughs> and, and as I mentioned, the, the real significance of this is when you're talking about Die kommen von Terra. working out the vast multitude of details that we really need to allow this universe to evolve and feel dynamic, we don't actually need all of the incredibly high fidelity, super computationally expensive stuff that we would get if we were actually simulating these NPCs the traditional way on the server so that they look exactly like they would when you see them. These NPCs don't need to do animations. They don't need to do physics. They don't need to do uh, collision detection. Okay, sie haben also das umgesetzt, was sie wirklich letztes Jahr gesagt haben, zumindest das, was er erzählt hat. Probably expensive to try. And in the end, even if we did it, it wouldn't make the end results any more accurate. So, they also have uh, personality traits too. Like yep. each one has a little bit yep. of something going on. Yeah, there are a number of different traits um, that we're modeling. We're still working out the exact configuration. Um, one of them is ambition, and that specifies how far a quantum can push themselves relative to others, whether in crime or legitimate enterprise. Another one is intelligence, and that dictates what sort of things they can pursue and how well they can do something. Uh, happiness is a measure of whether a quantum the singular form of quanta is miserable or content, and unhappy quanta want to change their situation, move to a new location, change occupations, and that sort of thing. Aggression controls the lengths to which a quantum will go to achieve their objective. A business-oriented quantum with a lot of aggression might push their workers harder, trading their happiness for more profit, and as a result have to deal with more turnover. And lastly, criminality, that determines the amount of criminal behavior that a quantum will consider. Uh, no criminality equates Der Markt ist echt cool, aber die physikalischen uh, existierten äh, NPCs können nachhelfen. Die Allianz müsste jetzt jeden einzelnen erwischen und Preise hochzufallen. Ja. Now, all of these quanta have basically come to rest within the system. And the reason for that is because there's nothing for them to do. There's no reason for them to get up off of the couch. So, let's jump to the next slide. We're going to add a little bit of interest to the system. Und das machen die gerade live in, in, in PTU oder, oder äh, bei live? Ich, ich, ich verstehe es nicht ganz, weil man hat ja echte Spieler gesehen und Devs. Die darum fliegen. So Kannst du mich da aufklären? Das habe ich jetzt noch nicht so ganz äh, gecheckt. Es tut mir leid. Still refuse to do anything, and that's because there's no economic reason for them to do it. There's nothing to do with the ore that they could go and extract. Let's go ahead and open up that card, though. That so that card represents the mine on Delamar, and you can see a couple of stats towards the top: quantity and purity. And what these are is basically telling you how much of that material is in that mine. And purity is, to some degree, a measure of concentration. It, it effectively details how easy it is to extract it. Um, there are a couple of parameters at the bottom that are temporary. Those will eventually be derived from those top two parameters. Um, but for right now, we can override it for some, of this, for some of the testing that we've been doing. So let's go ahead and jump to the next. So now we're going to go ahead and add an aluminum refinery to Crusader. Okay. And immediately you will see the quanta start springing to life. Geil. And what's happening is they've all figured out. <laughs> they've, that refinery, it once to build up a stockpile of aluminum. And in order to do that, it needs some raw aluminum ore. And thus, it's willing to pay for it. And so the quanta are, are seizing upon that economic opportunity, heading out to Delamar, doing the work, extracting that ore, and taking it back to the refinery. And this will continue until, it, you know, until, it's, until it's full. So let's go ahead and open that card up again, and we can watch the refined aluminum ore gradually build up.
you can also see the number of workers. A few of the quanta, so you see many of them actually acting as miners. There's also a number of them that are working uh, in that refining factory. Refineries can't process this material um, you know, uh, w without labor, and there's a formula that dictates how much labor is, is required in order to process this stuff. And so they have to hire a sufficient number of workers in, act in order to actually uh, execute this operation. Okay. And so this would continue for quite a while. Let's go ahead and speed up the simulation a bit. Okay, it's a stop the simulation. And go ahead and keep watching the aluminum inventory. Is that's finished? So they're now building up their raw ore. Das macht also gerade nicht live, sondern sie sind in der Simulation. Sorry, dass ich das nicht auf der Reihe hatte. There, the one refiner we've added has no more incentive to buy more. It's it's its storage houses are already full, and therefore it's not willing to buy. Since it's not willing to buy, the quanta have nothing to do. So what we're going to do now is add a factory. But before we do that, let's head on over to the power plant formula. And you can see here that building a power plant, um, just like refining ore, requires something. It requires some more working for a duration of 6 to 10 weeks. And it also, notably, requires two units of refined aluminum ore to, in order to produce one power plant. It's got to be more complicated than that, I promise. So. Yes. Again, we're, we're building up. So, let's go ahead and add the factory to Hurston. You gotta slow it down. Oh, going too fast there. Slow on down. And so once again, you oh, see, okay. see the and while the now you've refinery ihre Sachen wieder verkauft. The Good. factory. It's it's good langsam Kreislauf. Let's go ahead and open up the factory. The factory, just like the refinery, needs workers in order to build these power plants. It also needs refined aluminum. So now you've got multiple things going on. The factory is willing to buy refined aluminum. Someone has to transport that aluminum from Crusader to Hurston. So some of the quanta are basically working, you know, they're, they're basically working as freighters to move that, you know, to move that product from one location to another. Some of them were working at the factory on Hurston. Some of them were working at the refinery on Crusader. Some of them are heading back to Delamar to actually do more mining. So you've got an entire little, you know, economic cycle going here. However, it's going to wind up coming to a dead end here. Let's go ahead and accelerate it again, just like what we saw before, yeah, because eventually the factory yeah. fills up all of its warehouses. It can't take any more. It therefore has no more, you know, it has no more need for refined aluminum. That will eventually shut down the refinery, which will in turn eventually kill off the miners. So, yeah. Uh, and you can see there that the inventory is still building on the aluminum. Which is why there's still some activity. There's a lot, yeah. But as soon as it's done, it starts flatlining, so you see that yep. the uh, inventory is capped out. Yep. And now they're almost done. The factory is basically got it, it's it's got all it can handle. The refinery is all, it can, you know, all it can handle. Therefore, the <laughs> auch wenn es erstmal sehr trocken wirkt. So let's add one more node. A let's add a shop that sells power plants to Art Corp. Slow down again. And so now the loop is a bit more complicated. The shop is looking, it's a retail shop, it's looking to sell power plants. In order to do that, it needs to be able to buy them for one price, sell them for another. So it adds its markup on, and it, just like the factory that requires transport of the refined aluminum from Crusader to Hurston, it needs the power plants transported from the factory to it. And so if you notice, there, if the individual quanta, they'll actually have a little translucent circle around them if they're carrying goods. And so you can easily differentiate whether or not the ones that are moving, for example, from Hurston back to the mine are empty. They're going to load up on ore. And then when they're heading from, or back to Delamar, and then from Delamar back to Crusader, um, they've actually all got ore. And so this loop will actually continue indefinitely. And the reason is because we've cheated something for tonight, which, and it sounds very similar to what I was basically saying was a bad idea earlier, which is the shop right now is a simple consumer. It's, bur it's burning off that inventory. The difference here is that 
the solution to that is very simple in the context of quantum. And the reason is, these quanta, the next step of what we'll be working on is they'll actually require ships. Ships require engines. And so all of a sudden, there's a real demand for how many power plants do you need? How many ships do you need? It all follows the same you know, logical equation. Das ist, das ist wirklich cool. So let's go ahead and add a bit more economic complexity. Ich hatte gehofft, dass sie diesen Demand schon hätten. Diesen Loop jetzt vielleicht schon drin mit den Schiffen. Aber okay. So thus far, das System we've shown ist da. A very basic economic loop. One commodity, one refinery, one factory, and one retail shop. The real world, of course, is far more complicated. You'll have lots of different commodities, refining and production nodes, retail shops, and of course, players in quanta competing against one another for a limited supply of goods and services. <clears throat> It's this competition, this economic natural selection that ensures that things remain in balance, that a logical equilibrium is reached. So, our current architecture basically has players connecting to a game server. And, the ser and then we've got services behind the scenes that can feed information to these servers and receive information back in return. And so you can see here, you know, we've got shop services and probability volume services and all of this sort of thing. The basic problem with this arrangement is that services don't have any knowledge of what NPCs are doing or rather what they should be doing. So that shop service that controls the prices, it's got algorithms, but it has no real understanding. It doesn't understand that there are 10,000 NPCs that do or don't need this or what pirates are doing or any of that. We don't simulate at that high level anywhere within the game right now. You have servers that basically instantiate the stuff near you, and you have the services that can run the, you know, these formula, and that's basically it. Mm -hmm. Now. They can implement these services, these algorithmic price calculations, but supply and demand only comes from players and hard-coded formulae. And it's the same for missions and PVs. The data is completely static and can't evolve. The number of servers, of course, as we've seen here, uh, it varies depending upon how many players are in the game. So let's go ahead and add quantum. Quantum changes this in dramatic fashion. It gives us a place where we can efficiently simulate NPC behavior and then feeds that behavior to the game server so that players can experience it. Further, it allows player actions to be fed back into the simulation so that there's no meaningful difference between the real and simulated worlds. Quantum creates a complete loop. NPCs can be simulated in efficient fashion. And I actually meant to say that quantum feeds the services, which in turn feed the game servers. Okay. So let's go ahead and get back to the simulation. And what we're going to do now is alter the power plant formula. So let's add a bit of complexity by changing the production formula for power plants to require laronite. We're gonna add we need, some. We need to change, no, we need to change the production formula. No, we gotta change the, we're gonna add laronite first. Oh, right, yeah, okay. Yeah, we do want to add the new mine first. So we're going to add a, a Laronite mine to Walla. And then we want to go ahead and add a refinery for this Laronite. We'll add that to the Hurston L3. Okay, Raumstation können auch mit betroffen werden. Das ist cool. And now let's go ahead and adjust that power plant formula. And we're going to change the power plant formula. Right now, it requires zero laronite. We're going to change that to two. And what we're going to very quickly see here is that we're going to start getting some laronite flowing to the Hurston factory so that the power plants can continue to be created. Yep. And that's, that's, that, that's, that loop, that's that loop of guys right there. That's what they're taking. Um, now, one of the important things here is that the Let's go ahead and look at the Hurston aluminum. Bring Hurston factory aluminum. Oh, and jetzt gehen die Preise hoch und runter. Now, what wound up happening there is it was very low for a period of time, and that's because they were actually burning off that 
aluminum inventory as fast as they could get it. And the reason why you see that spike there in the aluminum inventory is because as soon as we altered the formula so that power plants now require laronite, they were still receiving from all these freight, freight, freight or transports, they still had aluminum coming in, but they could no longer produce power plants. So it stalled, and then all of a sudden they started stockpiling, stockpiling. And then when you see that the aluminum started falling, that's because finally the, the, they started receiving supplies of laronite, and they were able to resume the production process, and so all of a sudden their aluminum started getting burned off at a natural rate. So now we're going to add a bit more laronite out in the asteroid fields, and Jake's going to handle that via macro. And now let's go ahead and increase the supply of aluminum and see what happens. So we're going to add a few new mines. So let's add an aluminum das mine to selling müssen. first. I musste gerade AFK. Also ich, ich finde es wirklich, find's wirklich spannend. Schau es dir gerne nochmal an. And let's add one to Aberdeen as well. Ich lade das ja dann auch bald hoch. Falls du es dir auf meinem Channel nochmal ansehen möchtest. Sie haben quasi das alles nur nochmal eine Stufe komplexer gemacht. Eine, eine Ecke komplexer. Haben mehr Bedarf remember, für, für die Powerplants, die produziert werden. Also was die noch brauchen. Laronite. Und jetzt wird langsam zu einer richtigen Economy. They're telling us we need to hurry up. You guys want us to hurry up or keep going? <lacht> Wie geil einfach so. Sorry, die Leute wollen das jetzt right, sehen. So also Chris like Warwolf muss warten. <lacht> Let's add a couple more aluminum refineries as well to the Crusader L4 and Arcorp L1. Crusader L4. Yep, and Arcorp L1. Yep. So now let's go ahead. We just added all of this new aluminum. So let's head back to that Hurston factory and see what aluminum prices are doing there. What's that factory having to pay for aluminum with all this new supply, these new mines, these new refineries? And there you see that the price is starting to fall off. Yeah, okay. Can you spe speed, it, speed it up a little bit? Let's let you see what it does. And if you see, it continues to plummet. So those prices are pretty much falling off a cliff now. Yeah. From all that extra supply that's been brought on without us having to go back that's, and rebalance that's anything. Fine. Let's go. Um, so let's go ahead and head on over to Selen. And you can see that Selen is in very close proximity to Crusader. So you've got a ref an aluminum refinery and aluminum mining, yet there's very little activity. And the reason is because the aluminum at that mine is very difficult to extract. So let's go ahead and adjust the mining time on Selen from 180 to 120. And what this, again, reflects is how difficult it is to extract from that particular location. And so you see there now you see a few guys are actually willing to put in the amount of work necessary to extract it. Not all of them, it's still a lot of effort. And this comes back to every one of these guys having their own individual uh, set of traits. So some of them were willing to endure you know, more risk, more, you know, you know, uh, more effort, that sort of thing. So let's go ahead now and increase the laronite consumption. Let's just go with normal pace. All right. <laughs> there you go. So let's make the laronite more difficult to work with and more rare and see what happens there. So we're going to adjust the global laronite refining time from 60 to 120. We're adjusting the time on Walla. We're going to do both. Cool, yeah. that's all done. We want to take it to 60 to 120, and Walla's extraction time goes from 60 to 180. That's right. 
Ich hätte ich so gerne dann eine Datenbank, wo live die ganzen Preise oder und, und, und Bedarfe. So what we've just done is basically make it Aber das wäre natürlich more quasi time consuming, more difficult to refine it and we've basically made it more difficult to pull it out of the ground. So let's go ahead and apply a macro also to refault, to reduce the default purity of layer night from 50 to 16 percent, which means that refineries are going to need more ore to produce the same amount of refined product. We acted. And now let's go ahead and take a look at the layer night prices on the Hurston factory. So we just did three different things to make it considerably, you know, uh, more expensive for Laronite to be utilized. See it at that time. Ooh, and yeah. they're getting the price up. And you can see that Laronite prices are going up, up. It looks like they're starting to skyrocket. This could be a complete economic disaster. <laughs> If you notice, they're just going up, up, up. So what we're going to do now to bring that back into control is let's go adjust the power plant formula to compensate a bit. So let's adjust it from, instead of two layer night, let's change it to 0.1. So we just reduced the amount of layer night needed in the economy by 95%. And let's head back and check out the prices again. And es wird APIs geben, Schnittstellen, über die man äh, die Preise abrufen kann, um zum Beispiel Drillanbieter-Applikationen damit zu füttern. And there you go. Das glaube ich auch. Momentan gibt es ja eine Menge von den Sachen, äh, also schon Anbieter, wo man Handelspreise und sowas vergleichen kann, aber ich glaube, das sind alles nur statische Daten, weil das System ja auch noch nicht wirklich dynamisch ist. Ich hoffe sehr, dass es APIs geben wird, ja. Ich hoffe, die wird es auch geben, sobald es online kommt. So it's, it's already down 40, 50% and it'll keep, it'll keep falling. Um, okay, so now let's go ahead and add some additional factories. Delamar looks pretty dead. There isn't a lot of economic activity happening over there. So let's add a bit of life by adding a new power plant factory. And yeah, let's add a Hurston L4 factory for power plants as well to create a little bit of competition for aluminum. And then let's head on over to Hurston, Hurston factory, and let's check out their workers. You notice that their workers are falling off a cliff. What is happening? Whoa. Well, we just opened up a new power plant factory and they're getting offered better wages from another place. And so, And what are the wages on, on, on Hurston? Grab this guy. Let's see what the wages that they were offering. Um, I can't see it. So they were up at, is that 0.25? Yeah, Delamar is offering like almost three times the wages of. Yep, so there you see the differential, which is that factory is more desperate for workers. And so you see, let's go actually go, let's look at the, yep, the, Basically, the workers skyrocketed on Delamar and plummeted on Hurston. Um, and eventually, those wages, of course, stabilize. They find a point of equilibrium, which is a big you know, point of you know, all of this. So let's go ahead now and make some major changes. We're going to do this with a macro, and you can see where we currently stand on the slide. that we were supposed to be showing here. Absorb it quickly, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> There we go. So we've added lots of aluminum, titanium, and degreasium. In the entries that you see on the screen mark system, all of the moons now have deposits. Uh, we've added a bit more laronite, but it's still pretty rare. We've also added a lot of new refineries. We've added cooler and also quantum drive recipes to most factories, and ich mein, they require das aluminum, jetzt, das laronite, titanium, and degreasium. Kreislauf. The demand for cooler and quantum simple. drives has been introduced, also and also chaos. also sieht aus wie chaos. And lastly, we've increased, wenn, you can see there at the bottom of the screen, the number of quantum from 1,000 to 2,000, so that we've got enough workers to keep the economy humming. 
Now, previously, we've seen pretty obvious cause and effect. At this point, though, the economy is starting to get pretty complicated. And we can look at a few graphs to see what's going on with some of the prices to uh, see this. And this is one of the most interesting things about a really complicated economy, which is these changes in quantities and prices, the purposeful movement of quanta, this dynamism, these are all opportunities that you'll, you're going to be able to exploit within the game, and they're in constant logical motion. So, let's hit the next one. Jetzt verstehe ich auch eher, was du, was du vorhin meintest, auf jeden Fall. Somebody came to steal from these people, huh? Yep, we'll bring up the slide. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, yeah, this Berlin thing is in a live umgebung wird hard. But here, läuft jetzt alles All right, so now we've, inter we've introduced some, some pirates. Yeah. Um, mm. Let's go ahead, and so you can see that there are four pirate kraken. There's the Nova Riders, Low Riders, Nine Tails, and Dusters. Pirates have to return to Sind one of their bases in order to the refuel the pyro jump point. Um, Let's go ahead, if you notice, they head to the areas Muss of the highest aber. value. <laughs> uh, if you, let's go ahead and zoom in there. And you can see that those are missions being created by the NPCs, no different than players would. In other words, you see a lot of deaths on a route that's got a lot of value. Um, and let's go ahead and hover over some of those contracts. These are contracts that are being thrown out by the NPCs on that route. What's happening is the NPCs are basically being, you know, some of the freighters are being picked on by the pirates, the ship is being destroyed, and now that NPC is, has ejected and needs transport back to civilization. And so they're requesting that. And these are missions that would be fed back into the game that you'd see, and you could wind up accepting these. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, Hurston, the coolers yeah, and quantum drives. Check this out. This is where they're operating out of, you guys. Oh, right. uh, wow. Eh. It's from the game. It's not, it's not a thing. Do you want to check out? The Hurston. Let's look at the, what happened to the cooler and quantum drives. Oh, yeah. So, since we've now got a lot of pirate activity on that route, we want to see what's happening to the cost of some of those goods. Also, it's not the uh, model that you also trailer for the trailer. Yeah, Kraken! Ich bin mir ziemlich sicher, dass das nicht äh, schon eine wirkliche Kraken ist. Cool Wenn doch, Alter. Und dann vielleicht noch die Variante, die ich vorhin erwähnt habe. Das wäre krass. It's actually normal. Piracy is really terrible for economics, you guys. So. Yeah. So let's so go ahead now and you can really see it over at the coolers yeah. where it started at like a really reasonable thing. Like yeah, that's, that's pegged. It's just, it's the scale. So basically they were down around 1,000, 2,000 and now they just absolutely skyrocketed in price because so many of the freighters moving, whether it's supplies or moving, you know, the finished product from one location to another are now being intercepted. And these quantas I mentioned earlier, it's like they have various traits and and some of them are very risk averse and they Solange won't go down routes nicht where, hat, you know, there's a significant chance of death. And so to counteract uh, some of this danger, let's go ahead and bring in some of the fight pirates. Aber, ja, die kann man auf jeden Fall auch gut für Industrie so äh, gebrauchen. Sowohl für Ge Begleitschutz, Geleitschutz, vor allen Dingen für Geleitschutz, denke ich mal, aber auch so als Hub, also als Zentrale und natürlich auch zum Frachttransport. Ich denke mal, da wird ja auch nicht so schlecht sein. And Muss sich halt lohnen. There you can see, I'm going ahead and over. Let's speed it up a little bit, not 200. It's, it's 200 is too fast. It's difficult yeah. to tell what's going on. And if you notice, by the way, the Police will wind up patrolling an area, so they're in constant motion. Whereas the pirates basically are enabling uh, quantum interdiction fields. That's why they're basically picking a route on, you know, they're picking a particular location on the route between, you know, between two locations, and they're basically, you know, lying in wait. And the security, which doesn't know exactly where they are, is scanning the area looking for them. And so what you notice here is that the pirate situation is starting to look a lot better now that security's shown up. And you would cool. see this reflected over in the prices. And so what you have here is a perpetual game of cat and mouse to where the pirates look for the areas where they can reap the largest rewards with the least amount of risk, and security is then drawn to them. And as soon as you get enough pushback from the system in terms of security, then the pirates look for you know, more opportunistic you know, pastures. And again, this is very much like what you would expect to see you know, uh, you know, in any logical functioning system. 
Ich finde das geil. Ja. Ich find, wenn das so eins zu eins auch im Universum funktioniert, dann live. So, geil. let's go ahead and turn on the, the grid. And what you're looking at here is one of the big problems I referred to earlier is how we wind up getting samplings of this, you know, of how we generate probability volumes. And so what this is showing you is we can look at one of these high conflict areas and it's basically tabulating exactly what's in that area. So you can see that there are 10 total quanta, one freighter, 11 pirates, five security. Uh, it also shows you the total value being transported. You know exactly what's going down that route. Let's take a look at a few other locations. Here you see the security and pirates are fairly even. Six pirates, seven security. Uh, you know, a decent amount of value, six freighters. So it's a, there's actually an almost equivalent number of freighters, pirates, and security. This is the information that quantum, and it's a small piece of the whole, this is what it would wind up feeding periodically to the probability volume services, so that designers no longer need to go in and say, oh, well, we're going to hard code a certain amount of security, a certain amount of freighters, and it can never change. We ship it, that's all it's ever going to be. In this case, the simulation is running, it's constantly ebbing and flowing. And your actions over on the game side get factored into this result, just like any of the quanta in this simulation. Weißt du, ich, 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 ich finde das einfach geil, dass wir letztes Jahr wirklich mal was gehört haben, dass dieses Jahr umgesetzt ist, so eins zu eins auf so einer serverseitigen so Ebene, auf so einer Simulationsebene, auf einer Economy-Ebene. And the fundamental problem was that we didn't have a single area where the entire game could be simulated, where NPCs could request goods and services because they have a legitimate gedacht, economic need and can buy with nicht. players to provide those things. We didn't have a way for this activity to determine what you see as you wander around the universe, thus eliminating the need to spend enormous sums of effort configuring vast quantities of static data that could never deliver the dynamic experience we really wanted. Quantum solves all of these issues. It also provides us with a lot more context, which means that concepts not previously understood, like how much risk there is in taking an item from point A to point B, can now be easily calculated. Information like this is vitally important to the price discovery machinery, and as I spoke about earlier, in a properly functioning economy, such things can and will generate a lot of ripples. We also get the information necessary to properly customize mission content, meaning we can deliver a lot more environmental and mission diversity without having to do any more work. I've covered a few of the large areas that quantum will impact, but the hey, effects will be felt uh, far wider. Hey, hab gerade dein How many Video NPCs und, you see at a landing zone, angeschaut. for example, and what they're doing can now change also, over time. Ich Manufacturing towns might like boom and bust bei, depending upon how much commerce is passing sehr. through them at any Hi. given moment. NPCs can grow and evolve separately from their interactions with players into Tip. powerful bosses, potentially, and you'll be able to witness the their growth in a lot of different different ways. CIG criminal, criminal NPCs with a price on their head can move around the universe Danke. just like a player, Danke, making trying to catch them that much more fun. We've got a lot more work to do before Quantum is ready for integration with the rest of the game, but it's one of the last big steps in setting us up for a completely dynamic and systemic universe. Thanks for listening. Hey, super. I found this panel einfach, einfach klasse. Super.